Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lunch. And uh, uh, my name is Michal Hrušecký. I'm from a company called CZNIC. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, open source routers that we are actually making. I want to show you not just the routers themselves, but I would like to sp speak a little bit about uh, why we do it. And uh, actually, I would like to stress out a uh, few pieces of software that we are using and uh, how doing open source actually makes sense and uh, how it enables us to do awesome routers thanks to open source world and communities around the world. So, a uh, little bit about uh, our company. Uh, it's uh, well known in Czech Republic because we are actually Czech top level domain registry. Uh, legally, we are some kind of association of companies and uh, but uh, in fact, uh, in our bylaws, we have some statements that we are basically run as a non-profit. And the association of companies is because, yeah, Czech uh, technical companies founded us. And they are competing with, with each other, but they all agree that uh, they need a uh, stable Czech domain and uh, stable internet. And we are, we are supposed to make it happen. Uh, apart from domains, we are doing some other interesting open source development. We are doing uh, BERT internet routing daemon. We are doing uh, KNOT DNS server and DNS resolver. Uh, we are also doing some uh, yeah, uh, education. Uh, we are publishing uh, books about IPv6, uh, Git, LibreOffice, and stuff like that. And uh, we have also some TV series uh, that uh, teaches people how to use internet in a safe way. So we are trying to do good and educate people about uh, what to do and what, to do, what not to do on the internet. And uh, we are also doing those uh, Wi-Fi routers. How did we get there? And uh, why we are actually doing routers? Uh, it all started with uh, good old tourists. Uh, this is the first router that we made. It's uh, PowerPC based. It had uh, two cores, it had two gigs of RAM, some storage, uh, quite big for a router. The commodity routers that you buy in grocery store have something like uh, eight megs of RAM, if you are lucky. Uh, so it was quite uh, powerful hardware and our goal wasn't actually to make a router. We just needed a powerful hardware that we can give to people. We gave it to people in Czech Republic. And the only condition was that they will allow us to spy on them. Basically, our goal wasn't to sell more ads or something like that. But our goal was to actually figure out who's attacking home users and uh, how is the security at people's home with the internet. So we developed some software that reported some suspicious activities, uh, sent us firewall logs, and uh, even acted as a part of Honeypot, kind of. We get to the Honeypot later. And uh, we got all these data, and we did some security research on top of it. Apart from that, uh, since we were doing router, we decided to do it right, so we provide security updates, and not only security updates, but also feature updates. We are not restricting features uh, based on model, but whatever can run, we are trying to provide it even though, even to those old routers, even the new features that we are still developing. And we obviously give people a root account on their router because it's their device, so they deserve to be a root. And they deserve to be in control of their devices. So we did this, uh, and then our colleagues were going on conferences around the world and uh, presenting uh, what uh, security research they, they did and uh, what they found. And uh, they found out that uh, apart from uh, 
the security research that was really interesting for some people, people were really interested in the router itself because they said that it's a cool device and they want it as well. But uh, we basically did the device by ourselves. We gave it to people in Czech Republic because it was financed by money from Czech domains. So we didn't felt it was right to basically give it to anybody around the world when uh, basically Czech people paid for the domains and gave us the money to make it. So we did something that people can actually buy and it was called Tourist Omnia. I had a talk here two years ago when we were uh, building it. It's something that people can buy. Uh, all our spyware is optional. You can still join our research, uh, security research program, so you can still send us all the data that you collect and help us improve security on the internet. But it's your device, you can do whatever you want. You can reinstall it, you can run different distribution like OpenSUSE. And it's even more powerful and it's uh, interesting. Uh, one, one other interesting part is that uh, it has uh, ARMv7, so it's much more mainstream platform. And it has uh, yeah, some switch, plenty of ports, SFP, some PCI Express slots, MSATA, basically we put in everything that we thought that might be useful. So it does everything. Uh, the downside of doing everything and having everything is the price tag. It's uh, between two and 300 euros. And people were saying that uh, they really love the device, but uh, they would prefer if they can, uh, they don't need all those stuff that we put in. That uh, they would uh, like it just with one PCI Express and they don't need all those Ethernet ports and stuff like that. And can we make it a little bit cheaper, please? So we tried to make everybody happy. And we came up uh, with a new router that we are currently uh, running on Indigo campaign. And uh, we actually made the goal, so it's going to be done. We met the goal something like last week. And uh, yeah, we are trying to make everybody happy. And how do we do that? Well, we decided to make it modular. So yeah, I have, I have it here. So basically what we have is the CPU module. It's this one. It has just CPU, USB 3, and it starts from 29 US dollars. And yeah, it has gigabit Ethernet. But if you need more, you can just buy another extension module, plug it in, and uh, you can have another capabilities. Like this is a PCI Express with Wi-Fi card. We have some switches. Uh, some of them can be even chained. We have SFP. So you can decide what, uh, what uh, components you need and you can extend it as much as you want. Well, there are some technical limitations, but within that, you can extend it. And, uh, and if you don't need those additional interfaces, you don't have to buy them. And Yep, uh, so is it still a router? Well, it can route. It uh, can have even uh, 25 Ethernet ports, gigabit ones, it can have Wi-Fi, so it is a router. But uh, in more general sense, it is actually kind of single, single board computer that can be made into a router. It, is, uh, it doesn't have any GPU, so it's not your multimedia center. But it has gigabit, it has uh, USB 3, so and it has uh, plenty of extensions, so you can make it what you want, and it can be even your home server. So, a uh, little side note. It comes with a uh, U-boot, at least uh, this version. We are actually pushing all the patches to upstream, and uh, quite some are there already. So, we will probably at some point rebase even on newer U-boot, 
Uh, it has a Marvel Armada uh, 3720, and it will be shipping with 4.14 uh, kernel. So it looks promising from uh, open uh, SUSE point of view. So let's take a look how it how it uh, actually works. It, uh, Ludwig did a live release, so I will I decided to do at least a live demo. So we have a grab and. Uh, Let's see how far we will get. Basically, what we did, uh, I was uh, speaking with Andreas here. Uh, we downloaded uh, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed image, basically put it onto the flash drive. Currently, we copied uh, DTB on the flash drive as well. But in the end, uh, we hope that we will uh, somehow handle DTB inside uh, U-Boot in the production units, so hopefully you wouldn't need even that. And it's starting, booting, and hopefully we will get to the lucky ending, happy ending. Uh, it worked, uh, sir? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, uh, there is something called uh, device tree on ARM devices, which basically de describes the hardware. And uh, it's called, uh, well, device tree binary is DTB. And uh, yeah, all those devices have uh, support in the kernel. And uh, you just need uh, to say which peripherals are where connected and uh, how to access them. So that's what the DTB is for. Uh, we have SPI NOR, where it's already U-boot. Uh, we will probably have somehow DTB inside as well in the final units. This is just a prototype. So basically, when we copy the DTB over to Tumbleweed image, it booted like this. And uh, we have OpenSUSE running on top of it. But uh, apart from that, we are developing our own system for it uh, because, well, we want to make it uh, not only secure but also user-friendly and uh, bring actually security not only to uh, uh, advanced users but uh, to some home users. That's uh, and we are trying to simplify those uh, security features that you might be interested in. So. Even beginners can configure VPN and stuff like that. Well, uh, one use case for that, and what we actually decided that would be a nice fit, is a uh, next cloud. Uh, some people are asking for it, and uh, actually, it makes sense to combine our efforts because what next cloud guys are doing is uh, they are trying to get you an easy way how to solve host and um, manage your data in private way, so you have control over your data. And what we are trying to do is uh, make sure that your home network is secure and that uh, your uh, gateway to your home network is secure. So we actually have something for kind of ultimate self-hosting, something that can be, run, uh, can be running in your home, uh, doesn't take uh, that uh, large amount of electricity. Uh, you have a root account on it. You have uh, those automatic updates. So it's always uh, secure. And we have some additional security features that we are providing. Uh, we have a nice web interface that allows people to actually set up the device from the start. So. Yeah, it makes sense. So uh, we, uh, as I said, we have a nice, uh, easy open VPN support, so people can create a VPN server on our routers really easily. There is a web-based wizard that will basically create certification authority for you and will let you generate a client certificate and client configurations. It's not that hard, but 
even though I know how to do it manually, it's tedious work and uh, yeah, you don't want to generate uh, SSL certificates using OpenSSL and remember all the parameters and in months you will forget how, how you did it and yeah. So we did uh, easy OpenVPN support. We have automatic updates that gets downloaded and your router can be updated regularly. You can just set it up once and then uh, it will get, uh, it will stay up to date and all the security issues will get patched. So even the, oh well, we have uh, Nextcloud packages ready. So your Nextcloud will get updated even if you access it just via the Nextcloud application on your cell phone or something else. And even if you don't log in to the Nextcloud, you can have it uh, updated automatically by the system. Uh, newly, we have uh, even some web interface to actually format and set up hard drive so it will be mounted. And there are still some things that uh, we plan to do and that we are working on and that's uh, extend the web interface to actually allow setting up a RAID and uh, make it uh, even easier to install the next cloud from the web UI. So that's what we plan to do and uh, it makes quite sense with Mox because yeah, it doesn't have to have all those Ethernet ports and Wi-Fi's. It can be just a NAS box. We actually have an extension module that uh, provides uh, four USB 3 ports so you can connect uh, hard drives from the grocery store that you thought that you will be buying your router from. Uh, one thing that we had uh, on our routers from the beginning was kind of honeypot. And uh, it was something that we dedicated to our routers. It was one of our cool features. But people kept asking whether they can run it even on their server. And we actually made it possible now. It's called honeypot as a service. And uh, basically how it works is uh, that, uh, yeah, honeypots are cool and fun and it's really fun to lure attackers into your honeypot and see what they are doing, yeah? Uh, but uh, there is still some small risk. They, if they are clever enough, they might try to break through and they might escape at some point. So the solution is let somebody else run honeypot for you and we will do it for you. Uh, you can register on our website and install simple proxy package. It's available in Leap15 and Dumbleweed. And this proxy package will basically do man in the middle on the attacker and send, it, send him to our servers. So he will think that he, will, he actually attacked your router and he's a uh, step closer to building his own botnet. But in fact, he's running on CZNIC servers in Honeypot. And uh, you, were just, uh, you are just forwarding him there. Uh, to show you how it looks, this is the website. And uh, when you log in, uh, yeah, we have some global statistics. So even if you don't participate, you can see uh, who is uh, the most evil country. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can even get some uh, data of what attackers are usually doing. But uh, if you register, you can add your devices and you can see who was attacking actually you and what uh, password were, were they using and how many commands did they run. And you can actually take a look at the whole session, what the attacker was trying to do. And you get also statistics per your devices, so you can see that uh, your router is hated by China and uh, your server is hated by Poland and stuff like that. So it's fun. Uh, So that's one of the services that we developed for our routers, but then they 
uh, split to a separate project, and now you can use it even on your server. And you don't need the router to actually use it. Uh, another thing that uh, allows us to do quite some stuff on our router is uh, open source software called Suricata. Uh, what is it good for? It's, uh, it's uh, good when uh, your uh, simple firewall, when, where you just block ports, is not enough. And if you want to have some more information about what's going on in your network and basically what's going on between internet and your network. Uh, it's intrusion detection and prevention system. Uh, it works with some kind of network flows, and uh, it can Okay, sorry for the delay. Battery is run out. So, uh, yeah, where was I? Uh, Suikata. Uh, you can, it can look uh, much deeper inside the packet, and it can actually parse the data that are going through and interpret them somehow. So, uh, you can log the information, you can then process it somehow. Uh, I think on the first day, there was a talk by Peter Chanik about uh, Syslog NG, and he showed uh, quite some examples what you can do with logs that contain interesting data. And yeah, he loves to play with logs, and uh, in his uh, talk, he actually made it sound interesting looking at the, at the logs. So uh, if you get the data, you can do plenty of that stuff with data. Uh, but uh, apart from logging, what's going on and doing some statistics and maybe even getting some alerts, it's uh, also interesting that you can uh, actually write the rules. You can detect the stuff that you are interested in, get some alerts, and you can even block the stuff. So what stuff you can actually do from the traffic when it's actually most of the time encrypted anyway? So, you can get all the unencrypted communication, which is basically, nowadays uh, there is a DNS. Most of the time, most of the, most of the time, people still don't use TLS for DNS. But uh, even in encrypted traffic, uh, there are stuff like certificates that uh, are presented when you are connecting, SNEs, uh, yeah, some another interesting talk that was here yesterday, I think. There was a TLS 1.3 talk. And uh, yeah, SNEs wouldn't be available in new TLS, but you still get some information about certificate. And uh, yeah, sure, you can get a IP address, MAC addresses, how long did the connection take, amount of data, and stuff like that. And uh, you can alert when you see something interesting. So, uh, some examples, yeah. Okay, so one more slide about uh, what you can do with it. Uh, you can uh, monitor devices you don't trust. For example, if, uh, if you get a device that is not so friendly as ours, and you don't have a root account on it, and you have a new TV and you have no idea what the TV is doing on your internet or your washing machine or your, or your fridge and you want to know what they are doing, you can spy on them and see how much they are connecting to somewhere. If they are using unencrypted traffic, you can see what they are actually doing. Uh, my TV is regularly browsing Baidu for some reason and I haven't discovered why yet. Uh, yeah, you can try to detect this kind of stuff. 
there is also a large collection of uh, rules available for Suricata already, which are trying to detect various malwares and behaviors that uh, malwares are doing. Uh, yeah, typical behavior that some malwares. And uh, yeah, you can write your own, own rules, detect what you care of, uh, care about, and block it. So this is uh, just some example of what you can get from the flow. You get some information when when the session started, uh, how long it lasted, uh, how many data was transferred. Uh, but uh, let's take a look at the interesting bits. For example, if we get a TLS connection, so basically somebody uh, accessing uh, a server in encrypted way, you still get information about what server, uh, what uh, company uh, issued the certificate, usually what server it is issued for, and much more data. And everything you can see here is actually what you can match and create alerts on top of, and what you can actually use to block stuff. So you can just write some simple rules that say, hey, if uh, there is a facebook.com in certificate, block this connection. And yeah, it wouldn't help you if uh, the device already has established secure connection, but it will actually allow you to block the establishing of the secure connection. So, uh, Not this one, this one. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, yeah. One thing that we are using it for, uh, I was, yeah, we have a website that we developed. It's basically a demo website of our rotary interface. So we can look at it uh, later a little bit. And, uh, one thing that we are using Suricata for is basically to give you some overview of your traffic. So in our router, we uh, we are using Suricata to monitor your network if you install it. And then we are collecting some data about where you went, uh, which devices connected where, what protocols, and we are getting uh, we are we are matching all those flows with the names of the service that you are accessing. Uh, we don't, uh, the, the interesting part about this is that uh, you don't see just the IP address of the server that you try to access. Uh, if we saw a DNS query before, we remember it, so we know what, uh, what host name your computer was searching for and uh, the IP was uh, the answer to, and uh, if we see uh, SSL handshake and uh, we can deduct a host name from it, we use that one as it is uh, even more precise information. Uh, why is it important? Is that uh, you have those uh, web hostings that uh, have uh, tons of websites on one, one IP. And uh, you might be interested in which one was the computer actually trying to access. Whether it was uh, some cooking site, whether it was uh, some how to make a bomb site. So yeah, you need to distinguish between those. And that's what we are doing, and we are presenting it, it in a user-friendly way. So since I use this opportunity to show you this site, uh, Let's take a look at what else do we have here. This is our web interface. Uh, I was already speaking about some settings. Yeah, one uh, important uh, lesson that we learned from all those honeypots, if you remember it. Yeah, if you look at them, uh, most of the passwords and login informations are quite simple. Yep. Oh, yeah, sorry.
Let's see. Okay, so now it's visible. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Did you saw the stuff that I was showing before or were you just afraid to uh, ask that you don't see it? <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is the list of uh, people that were trying to attack one of my computers. And yeah, you see even here that uh, one thing that people are trying is uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. There is uh, also uh, similar default uh, passwords for Ubiquiti routers and stuff like that. So one thing that uh, we did uh, in uh, our web interface is that there is a first run wizard that you have to go through to actually get access to the internet. And the first, uh, first step of this wizard is setting up your password. So there is no default password and you have to set it up before you connect to internet. Uh, then we have these notifications. Those can be sent to your email address as well. So even though router updates automatically, uh, you get uh, emails when it does and what it installed, and you still have some information about it. Uh, one thing that we are uh, doing a little bit differently is also that uh, we are doing DNSSEC validation by default. Uh, who of you don't, well, it's easier to ask uh, who heard and know what is DNSSEC? Okay, so about the third of audience, that's kind of good. Uh, yeah, DNSSEC is basically a way to actually sign your zone data and uh, yeah, basically your ISP is usually providing it, you with a DNS resolver, but unless you verify the keys and verify the data that he is sending to you, he can try to redirect you somewhere else to some other server even if you try to access something. Uh, that's commonly used in some cafes and restaurants, basically. You ask for some server and they will redirect you to their portal. So to avoid being redirected to malicious site, like a portal, uh, you can use DNSSEC to validate uh, uh, the answers and uh, that's something that we have enabled by default. Uh, and because uh, quite some ISPs has, have uh, broken uh, DNS servers, uh, we can run full resolver on our router and it will resolve DNS by, by itself. So you can avoid broken DNS servers uh, of your ISP. Uh, and what I wanted to show as well is a uh, VPN configuration, how it looks like. I said that it's uh, simple. Uh, at the beginning, you just uh, say that you want to generate certification authority and it will do everything. And yeah, it shows some settings, but uh, uh, you can change the IP, but uh, if you don't, it will work. And it allows you even to make, uh, make it so that uh, all the traffic will go to your VPN. So if you are in some countries that uh, you know that they are spying on you, you can use uh, VPN if they wouldn't block everything uh, to actually connect and uh, go through your home network and uh, send all your traffic uh, to your home. And uh, when you want to create some uh, client for your VPN, you just enter the client name. Yeah, Is it kind of visible? Okay, yeah. Yeah, usually all these uh, data projectors has a uh, lousy resolution, so everything is big. But uh, at this conference, we have a high resolution beamer, so. Yeah, so uh, you just enter the na uh, name of your client, click create button, and it will generate the configuration. And then you can uh, get a config that is uh, that contains all the certificates embedded. So 
you can just have a one file, copy it to your Android phone or your computer, and connect to your VPN. Another interesting part that we did is uh, some uh, measuring of network connectivity. So uh, we have some software that can periodically measure your speed, so you can have an uh, idea of uh, how good your connection is, and when you are sharing it with multiple people, how much bandwidth do you have at some point in time. So, I think that was all that I have prepared. A uh, few pointers uh, at the end. Uh, that's our main website. Uh, the site that I was clicking through and showing you how it works is called demo.touristcz. Uh, Honeypot as a service can be found on uh, can be found on Haas uh, Nick CZ. Uh, Tourist Mox, which is the new modular router you can get on uh, Indiegogo. And uh, we are making open source devices, so there is a link to our GitLab that contains plenty of projects that, are, uh, that have uh, sources for the stuff that we are uh, using in our routers. So thank you for your attention. And now, do you have some questions? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. Very, very uh, enlightening. Uh, so if some of us would like to contribute software and feedback, that's understandable. What about the hardware engineers who are interested in taking your designs, extending them, manipulating, improving, or maybe making their own modules for the, the new uh, architecture? Okay, so uh, regarding the hardware, I didn't mention it uh, that much, but uh, we have uh, full schematics online. So you can read up uh, how the hardware is connected. Uh, and uh, uh, the layout schematics is good. Layout is better. KiCad, something open source? Uh, unfortunately, I think that the layout was done in some proprietary software because uh, our hardware guys had uh, troubles making it in open source one. For some reason, I'm not a hardware guy, so I I don't know the details. But they run into some problems in there, and uh, we don't uh, currently release a whole uh, PCB layout as it is, because yeah, we are trying to make those routers, and we don't want uh, cheap knockoffs. But we will release it uh, once we stop making them. And uh, regarding the new twist mocks, uh, there is some specification. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I will find it. Uh, OK, uh, probably I wouldn't find it right now. But uh, somewhere on our website, there is a complete specification about uh, the connector, what we are using for yeah, for what we are using for connecting various modules is basically a PCI connector that can be found anywhere. It's not some special proprietary connector. Uh, the tricky part is uh, wiring. We are not using the classical PCI, but we are using uh, we are passing through uh, PCI and SGMI and uh, various other stuff. There is also electricity and yeah, some power and stuff like that. But uh, we have some documentation online, what you can find on which pins, and that's probably all you need to develop your own module. So a couple of questions. First of all, um, obviously when some of us power users are trying to hack on those devices then you know we can get by with having an ssh interface and so on what do you think would be necessary or what do you see as the missing bits in order to make um, the browser comfortably usable 
for average users on an open source basis. Like, do you think it would be possible to take the web interface and uh, just package that for, for open source? Well, uh, the tricky part is that the web interface is kind of tied to uh, the kind of tied the to the config files uh, of open uh, WRT? Or? Yeah, uh, we are, we are based. Yeah. I think I maybe didn't mention it, but, uh, we are running on our routers OpenWRT Linux distribution. Uh, therefore, uh, stuff that is available for OpenWRT is available for our routers as well. And uh, the tricky part is if you want to have a similar user experience on OpenSUSE based system, uh, OpenWRT has some specific, uh, some specifics regarding the configuration of the stuff. So you would have to re-implement that part. But uh, the web interface is actually written in Python. And uh, nowadays, it's not that tight to uh, to the actual OpenWRT. There is some backend and front, uh, backend and, front end, and uh, you just need to, there's some uh, generalization, some abstraction layer in between. So you just need to re-implement the backend, and you can use all the front end. Or uh, there is a SUSE manager, right? <laughs> and I think uh, WebYast is dead, right? Thought so. Yes. Yes. Or do you have any more question? Yeah, I, I do. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so um, you talked about this uh, Zurichata. Yeah. Um, framework. Um, did I understand correctly that this is something that you have developed on your own? No, no. That's uh, one of the open source projects that we use. There's a huge community around it. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, and we just, uh, well, kind of abuse it to currently do the simple, simple uh, overview of your network, uh, network traffic. In the future, we want to implement even the rules, but uh, it's a generic open source project and uh, being open source actually enables us. It's a nice example where being open source actually enables us to do quite some interesting stuff without uh, too much effort, without basically writing it from the scratch. We can use open source software and provide our users with uh, extra functionality. Right, but there's, there's not just one DPI. Um... Um, open source project, right? There's also some, one called Snort, and I don't yeah. know some, a couple of others. Do you have any overview, like what the differences are and why Zurichata is best? Well, uh, I wouldn't say that I have a huge overview of all of those, and we just picked the Zurichata because we liked it. Uh, yeah, if you like Snort, you can use Snort. I think we have it in our repositories as well at some point. Uh, not sure about the current state. Uh, whether it builds or stuff like that, and not sure whether other stuff uh, from this area builds and how well they they run. We just took some extra efforts to integrate Suricata because we liked it, and we like the community around it. Then third question: the Honeypot as a service. Um, if we install that on an open source system, are there any configuration settings necessary or? Um, like, are you, um, if you're redirecting the traffic from the local system <coughs> to your servers, is there any QoS assurance or traffic shaping going on to assure that they cannot DOS the actual router? Uh, I don't think there is some Q, Q, uh, QoS. Uh, you can probably set it up in your system. Uh, and there is some minimal configuration that you have to do basically if you want to track your, well, when you want to track uh, stuff, you have to generate some token and insert the token into the configuration file. And I think that's uh, the most important part. Then, yeah, you obviously want to run it on port uh, 22 on SSH port. So you probably need to move your SSH somewhere else, open up the port on the firewall and make sure that you can connect to the different port before yeah cutting you uh cutting yourself out of your box but uh yeah i think i actually wrote a blog post how to do that 
when I packaged uh, Honeypot as a service for OpenSUSE. So it's somewhere on planet OpenSUSE. Uh, but uh, yeah, the configuration should be pretty easy and pretty simple. So most of the time, you just need uh, the token from the website. And if you are happy with the default settings, then you are all done. QoS, you have to implement yourself somehow. Yeah. Um, two things. I mean, I don't think you mentioned uh, when the tourist mox is starts delivery or when it should be yeah. done. Uh, current plan is uh, that uh, most of the base modules uh, should be. I think we promise something like October, so generally end of the year. Uh, some of the new modules, like the USB one and pass-through uh, uh, pass modules, uh, will take some extra time. And I think the scheduled date is something like December, because uh, there, those are the ones that we started to work on lighter, and they are more complex. So it took us. Uh, it will. It took us some more time to prototype them, and yeah, there is still some work ongoing on those. Um, actually, I came up with a third question, but first a second. Um, I saw you opened the or, or kept the fundraising open a little longer. Are you going to extend it again? Uh, we cannot extend it again, but I think that it can be changed to in demand mode or something like that where people will be able to buy uh, additional devices and stuff. But uh, yeah, that's something that uh, our marketing and business people do. I'm just a developer, so I don't, I don't see into that stuff that much. Uh, there might be some, uh, uh, it might uh, get a little bit uh, more expensive and yeah, it will eventually get to retail. But uh, yeah, if you support us now in the campaign, there is some discount for that. Yeah, it's like a week longer, I think, it's yeah. running. Yeah. Uh, it should end uh, next Thursday. All right, cool. Um, and then last one was, um, like you mentioned, OpenWRT that you guys use um, and, and, and some other projects. I mean, how much do you guys contribute back upstream? Yep, uh, we are trying to get to, but uh, we contributed some patches to OpenWRT. Currently, uh, we are, uh, yeah, it was, uh, there was some uh, forks and difficult situations in OpenWRT community. And in between, we accumulated plenty of changes that we are trying to clean up now and uh, basically ditch everything that we uh, forked and didn't have to. And uh, we are trying to polish all the patches and send it upstream. Uh, regarding uh, the mocks, uh, U-boot that, that you saw is basically almost upstream. I think that uh, my colleague said, send, uh, said me that uh, he had to refactor some patch. Uh, so it might not be in upstream uh, yet everything, but uh, there is a huge part that is already upstream, and the plan is to be to have everything upstreamed. Uh, we want to upstream the kernel support as well, where we are waiting for some uh, other subsystems also to upstream their patches. But uh, yeah, we are we will try to push everything upstream as we can. Yeah, we are trying to. Yeah, we had uh, we had uh, quite some changes in the old OpenWRT3 before it all uh, settled somehow, and it's uh, hard to merge. But we are trying to clean it up and slowly push everything. Um, have you tested much with PFSense, Monowall, or these uh, class of uh, router um, software packages? Uh, BF Sense is BSD, right? Yes. We don't have BSD, we have Linux. So, <laughs> so unfortunately, that uh, blocks us from using uh, BF Sense. 
so we didn't try it. But uh, we actually, there was some question on uh, our Indiegogo. Uh, somebody asked us about uh, BSD support. We told them that basically, well, we have limited resources, so we are trying to focus on what we ship by default. But uh, they said that uh, CPU shouldn't be that uh, that hard, and it should be somehow supported in FreeBSD. So, yeah, uh, somebody might do the port for OpenSUSE. Uh, Andreas did a lot of work on Omnia. So, yeah, if we get somebody like Andras in FreeBSD, there will be FreeBSD port. There? So um, there are no closed firmware blobs necessary to run this device. Uh, in Omnia, we are we were using uh, ATH 10K Wi-Fi cards, which requires firmware. But uh, all well, all our cards are not soldered in, so you can replace them. And I'm not sure about Armada and ATF and those weird secure V8 stuff. Do you know, Andreas? For the um, Armada 8K for on the Macchiato bin, there is a free RTOS based blob that is being used for a Cortex-M processor that's part of the uh, the SOG. And for that, I've not yet found the corresponding sources, but in theory, it should be possible to rebuild that. Yeah, well, uh, all the software that we are compiling is open source, but we, have, we are using some tools to uh, flash U-boot. I'm not sure how uh, well, they are in uh, supported uh, by Marvel. That's something that uh, our kernel guys mostly deal with. But uh, kernel is open source. Uh, U boot as well. Uh, user space, yeah. Uh, not sure about this uh, really, really low level stuff. So flashing. U-boot should be possible via U-boot itself, yeah. which requires to have a working U-boot on the device. If you have one, then you're good. If it's somehow bricked, then I think there's closed tools from Marvel for the 3700. I mean, would probably be possible to reverse engineer that, but that would take someone with the time and desire to do that. Yeah, we, so there are we, we would have, we would have a desire. I'm not sure whether we will have uh, the time right now. And, uh, frankly, I, I have no idea how, what the state on those low level stuff. But, uh, yeah, it can boot over the serial with those Marvel tools. And, uh, we are shipping with, yeah, the Mox, uh, is, uh, Mox has a SPI NOR. And we are shipping with the U-boot already. So you have a working U-boot that you can start from. Anything else? No? Then thank you for your attention. And if you have any extra questions, uh, find me somewhere out there. Or come to our forum or mail us or something. Thanks.